Hello, my name is Dr. Phil Winder and I'm CEO of Winder.ai. Just before we start, just a little bit of admin. Um, I'm a little bit poorly today. I've got, I'm, I've got a bit of a cold, so my voice is a little bit croaky, so I apologize for that. During this presentation, it's being streamed to uh, LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter. If you have any questions, just place the questions in the, the chat functionality of that particular medium, and it should make it through to, uh, to, to, to this streaming interface. I will try and answer all of the questions at the end of the video. There is a little bit of a delay on the stream going out. So uh, yeah, bear with bear with me with, with that delay. Um, okay, so as you know, we specialize in the use of ML and RL to deliver uh, AI applications. And we also work significantly in the area of ML ops. And that is what this talk is about today. I want to talk about packaging your models. Um, so what is packaging? By packaging, I mean taking a trained artifact and turning, to, turning it into something that can be um, leveraged and served and used elsewhere. Okay, so I've got a presentation here. It's quite a long presentation, um, a bit longer than I normally do, so we may run over time a little bit. My apologies. Um, you can always catch up later on with the, the recording, uh, but without further ado, let's get started. So there's lots of different packaging methods. Depending on what you use, what tools you use, they're, they're, they all tell you to package your models in very different ways. And I wanted to do a little bit of research to learn what the common themes are to see if I can pull out any recommendations for you. In, in, I've split these types of packaging methods into three sort of distinct areas. The first one is the cloud vendors, the key cloud vendors. The second one is orchestrators. And the third one is packages. So packages, sorry. The cloud vendors are the cloud vendors. Um, I'm going to talk about those managed services and how they expect your model to be presented. Orchestrators are things that are responsible for abstracting away the definition of a serving model. And, and, how, and there's a few of those about, so we'll talk about how they expect to uh, package your models. And then finally, there's this sort of category emerging called packages, and they, they are... Uh, a slightly more declarative way, a slight, uh, 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 an optimization, an abstraction over the top of a model or, or a model workflow. Um, and a part of that abstraction allows you to build and package models. So we're going to investigate these three very different types of, of methodologies and then contrast and compare the different themes that run throughout them. My assumptions when creating this talk is that I'm always interested in how you customize a workload, how you customize the container, customize the code, because uh, as you've probably already seen, many of the cloud vendors provide you with very almost point and clicky ways of, of defining um, models and, and model, model, model serving um, uh, artifacts. But in real life, in real industry, there's always exceptions and actually, what we see in especially in larger enterprises the the exception actually becomes the norm you know most containers are custom containers um for example and i'm also going to assume that we're working on real time inference i.e we're you know imagining that we're exposing an interface via a rest api or something like that for for real time um synchronous workloads Although throughout my research, I did see that the batch and async workloads are also orchestrated or, or delivered in very similar ways. So some of the ideas should also apply to those types of workloads too. So first, I'm going to go through a couple of those, um, <clears throat> a couple of examples in each of those three categories. I'll try not to spend too long talking about them. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. The first category I'd like to talk about are the cloud vendors. I'm going to look at the three main cloud vendors here. Uh, and the first one is SageMaker. So SageMaker is a tool from Amazon, as you probably know, uh, from AWS. And inside the AWS SageMaker docs, there is the deployment section. It's kind of almost seen as a slightly different part of the product to call it SageMaker Deploy. And um, there's a link to the, the documentation at the, the top of the page there. For all of these, I'm looking at the bring your own container style of working, because that really allows us to provide our own code, our own container. But most of the cloud vendors also do have low code or no code options if you are looking for that as well. 
SageMaker expects that your model artifacts are stored in S3. And this is a theme that runs throughout the cloud vendors. They assume that the artifacts, the model artifacts, i.e. the model weights and the model settings are stored in a very specific format in the cloud vendors blob storage of choice. The specific format of the, those files depends on the container that you're ultimately going to run these models inside to serve. Therefore, the, the container will expect a specific format and usually a specific directory structure. So for example, if you've got a PyTorch model or and you're running it in Torch serve, it'll expect the PyTorch uh, um, you know, uh, packaging format. Same for TensorFlow, same for all the other frameworks as well. In order to instantiate one of your models, you have to use the create model API. It's basically a massive JSON config. I can't provide an example because it's just too big. Um, but there's a, a couple of restrictions in that API. The first one is that the um, the model runtime, they, 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 they kind of manage their own, they curate their own runtimes. And if you use them, they're very, very opinionated. You have to use a specific directory format. You have to use a specific Python interface. You have to execute those interfaces in a specific way. And finally, one of the biggest pain points actually is that the container that you're going to use must be AWS's own or in ECR or hosted in a VPC. So basically you're not allowed to use a external, um, an external container registry. And again, that's a bit of a theme. And it's uh, it's, it's a bit frustrating because, uh, especially in our work, we work in across multiple clouds. And um, we often actually have to copy containers between clouds. And that, that's really troubling and stressful from a, a lineage and provenance perspective. Certainly not ideal. For GCP, they have the, their AI platform. And they also have the uh, AI uh, Vertex AI as well. And I've only got one slide for, 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 all, for both GCP products. And that's basically because you deploy in very similar ways. The, the, the difference between those two products is the abstraction level. Um, AI platform is a little bit of a lower abstraction, whereas Vertex AI is a little bit higher. But you follow a very similar pattern to de ultimately deploy a model in those environments. Um, the only thing that changes is the you know, the, the subcommand that you run or the API that you call. So once again, the model artifacts have to be stored in GCS. They can't come from anywhere else. But the only difference now is, is, is this one. This is quite an interesting one. So GCP splits up the registration and instantiation of a model into two separate steps. So first you register a model and then you create an instance of that model. They call it a model version. And, um, We'll see that Azure does this as well. And actually, that's a really nice abstraction from a model management point of view, because you have this, you know, this, this distinct model thing that's supposed to do a job and then instances of that thing. Um, that wasn't there in SageMaker. And, uh, and, 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 and I think that's a, a nice addition from Azure and GCP. Um, in terms of expectations, GCP accept, expects that your container implements an opinionated REST inf interface. But that's it. So no Python related requirements, no Python interface, no file structure interfaces. You just have to implement a REST interface. And that's, again, that is, a, that is quite a nice thing because you can then effectively use any container uh, and, and add a shim or maybe just implement the REST interface inside your container. And uh, yeah, that, that, that means it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to integrate it with, with AI platform. There's also a, a, a no container approach that AI platform provide. Um, and once again, we have the same sort of workflow in order to generate a model. The only difference here is that if you are using this sort of, well, it's, sorry, it's not, an, it's, it's not a low code method. It's a, it's, a, it's a full code method, but it's a, it's a no container method. So you don't have to provide your own container. You can use one of theirs. You just have to have file conventions, file name conventions, interface expectations, et cetera. It's very similar to the, the SageMaker way of, of working, but a little bit, I would say a little, a, a little less strict because you only have to implement this very simple Python interface. Um, so that might be an option if you've got some simple models to, to try. And then we come to Azure and 
on the Azure side, um, there are some similarities and some differences. So the first similarity is that they also have this idea of registering a model and registering a, uh, an instance of that model. And again, you can specify a container, um, but, but then there's a few differences as well. Uh, firstly, the container has to implement a Python interface, not a REST API. So their runtime actually peeks into the Python container, picks out a file that's specified in a, in a configuration and actually runs parts of that Python code. So it doesn't use REST in order to interface with your model, which is a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit low level for my liking. Um, also, th there was a, there's another problem with the, the specification of the model. So here in this register, this model register command, um, they, they, they're, they're passing in the model weights there. And, and we've, in, in our experience, we found that that mechanism is a, a little bit flaky. Um, everybody else just expects the, those model weights to be in um, blob storage, but Azure doesn't by default. It actually expects them to be local and they're pushed into, uh, um, into, into storage, which, which makes it a bit problematic for other tools to kind of um, interact and deploy these models on demand. Um, so yeah, and I mean, and, and that's like in my experience, that's a, a bit of a feature of, of, of most of Azure. There's always these sort of weird edge cases that they don't quite work how you expect them to do, uh, to work. Um, so yeah, not, not as much of a fan of, of Azure as the, the other two services. All right, so moving on to orchestrators now, one of the most common and most popular orchestrators that we love using actually is a project called KServe. It used to be called KF Serving. It is a Kubernetes native orchestration layer. It attempts to abstract the definition of a model and um, it uses some quite complicated underlying technology, but what it allows you to do is to have a really high utilization, scale to zero, really nice APIs and interfaces, uh, and works well if you've if if you're a, a Kubernetes shop, the whole uh, deployment of one of those models is done via this inference service CRD. Basically, you have to specify weights separately to the container that's going to run that model. So let me say that again: you have to separate the weights from the serving container. You specify the serving container and you specify the weights separately. You store the weights somewhere where Kubernetes has access to. That could be any of the blob storages. It could be a PVC. It could even be a URL, but it needs access from the, you know, from that node that it's working on. And it then pulls in one of a range of serving containers. And this is, this is actually genius. This is really, this is where KServe shines. Um, the serving containers you can pick from a wide range of containers to use as that serving container. And they all have sort of slightly different feature sets. Some work with certain technologies, some work with GPUs better, some work with CPUs better and so on. Um, but they're all really decoupled in this interface here. So it's very easy to switch from one to the other. Um, you can also specify custom containers via a KServe Python interface. And once you've implemented that interface, you can build it into a KServe ready container, which basically has all the REST API. It's basically a REST API that you need to implement. But you can build it into a container using uh, their curated build packs. Um, so yeah, I, th this is one of our favorites. I've also skipped the, a slide on Selden Core because the, the engineers behind Selden Core are also heavily involved in KServe. And so they kind of work in very similar ways. They've got a very different, a very, a very similar feel to them. Um, they both have slightly different functionalities and obviously one's, you know, open source and unsupported and one's commercial and supported. So, you know, you have to weigh, weigh, weigh up those pros and cons. MLflow is another open source project that is actually capable of serving containers. And actually MLflow has emerged as a bit of a, a standard model registry and a standard model format. MLflow stores its models in an opinionated file-based structure, and it has helper APIs to allow you to, um, uh, to, to save trained models into that format. Um, when it comes to serving, there is uh, an MLflow CLI where you can run MLflow serve and then the, the location of those 
of, of those files you've just saved and it gives you a, a nice API, a nice REST API to, um, to, to query. However, the issue is ML flow is entirely Kubernetes adverse. It's, it's even container adverse. It's built, as you know, by Databricks and Databricks are not keen on supporting the Kubernetes ecosystem so much because they have their own products. Um, and therefore, it doesn't come out of the box with any containers, with any Kubernetes manifests, with any way of actually deploying that thing into a container. So other projects have popped up, uh, you know, anywhere, anywhere from um, just having like a, your own Docker container, which runs the mlflow serve command, all the way through to dedicated projects that are using the mlflow storage format and then implementing their own serving logic like uh, uh, uh like selden's uh, ml server for example that's an example where they can use the ml flow storage uh format and turn that into a serving container cortex was is another one that sort of pops up every now and again um it's slightly it's a little bit out of scope um it, it is a serving framework and it does have expectations but the only expectation is that it expects a container so ultimate flexibility, any container in any format, with any interface, it just exposes that as a REST API. Um, but Cortex is quite interesting from a, an infrastructure perspective, if you're interested in that topic. It's a bit off topic now, but they have a, 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 a nice suite of tools for spinning up an entire uh, ML infrastructure that you might be interested in. There's a few other related tools as well. I want to give a shout out to the same project, and that's something that we're involved with. Um, slightly different aim there. The, the, the aim there is to make training pipelines more reproducible. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit related, but not quite related to packaging the model. Um, but it's got some similar ideas there, uh, being declarative, declaring pipelines, things like that. Forest flow um, is a is a, a, another interesting tool, but it uses exactly the same ML flow format. Um, so that's got a really interesting way of, of of defining models and graphs of models. So you might be interested in that. And there's also Acumos AI, um, which is a, an Apache project, but I struggled to understand what it was trying to do. So uh, uh, I left that off the list. Finally, we come to packages. So one of the most common and one of the most sort of, I'm, I'm not sure about popularity, but one of the most talked about at least is a project called COG. And COG started off as a way to declare how to build machine learning serving containers. Um, and it's kind of expanded now into a, a declarative way of defining what a model is. And it does that by, um, implementing a, a simple opinionated Python API. So like the others, you basically have to implement like a run function. And um, and then you can import whatever models, uh, you know, you can load whatever model weights, however you want to, um, whether they're external or baked, there's no opinions of, no opinions there. And then you define a, a configuration file, a meta, a meta file, which defines the pip requirements, the Python version, um, packages, and, and the, the, the links to the, the code and things like that. And then you use a, a CLI to build that into a container. Um, it's a little bit, uh, at that point, that, that's where the project starts to fall down a little bit. Effectively, it templates a Docker file and writes it back to your file system and then passes it to Docker to build. So it's, it's a very local, way of, of working and then there's a couple of a couple of issues with that but still it it presents a really interesting idea of trying to abstract the definition of a model in a declarative way you know and it's it, it moves it away from this sort of complicated set of docker files that some people might consider to be complicated and moves them into an abstraction which is which is useful to to make these projects simpler Bento ML has a, a very similar idea. This is a project where, again, it's got a, a Python library that, that exports a trained model into an opinionated file structure. There's a few more bells and whistles here, though. It, it's got some really nice features. It exports a, a Swagger definition, all the PIP requirements and the Docker file and stuff. 
um, it, what else does it, does it export? It exports a few things that are sort of really nice, nice to have. And they're the types of things that you can only do once you start declaring your model as an abstraction, because then everybody has to use that abstraction and you can start to automate the underlying generation of things like Docker files and Swagger de definitions. Um, you then use the, the Bento ML CLI to, to, to build your container. So again, you're defining all of the pip packages and all of the things that you need and all of the code effectively in a Docker file, but via this, this YAML spec. And you use the, the, the Bento ML CLI to, to, to build that into a container. The actual container used is a, um, a, a Bento specific container called Bento Server. And it supports all major versions, but it doesn't allow you to, to, to swap that out. You have to use their serving container. Um, the interesting thing here, or between these, these packages that we've been talking about, actually, is that all of them are baking them into the container. They're not using these external serving containers. Bodywork ML follows that same sort of pattern of being declarative, of, of defining your models in, 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 in YAML, um, but it takes it one step further. It also attempts to declare the ML lifecycle in YAML as well. So you have this YAML file that points to training script, to testing script, to pre-processing scripts, and also uh, some settings to build it into a final container. So this is a really, really nice idea where you're abstracting out the whole ML lifecycle that you can then sort of build nice to have sort of tooling around. Um, it automatically builds it into a container and then adds some bells and whistles. Um, one, one slight problem that, that I have with it is that it expects you to use exactly the same container for the, the exactly the same base container, at least, for all of those steps from pre-processing training through to serving. Um, in my experience, uh, in, in, in most companies, you, you're usually looking to use a different container from training through to serving because they have different requirements, different needs. But I feel like that, you know, if, 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 if people like this, that's, that's not a hard thing to change. It's just a, a bit of a, an API change, that's all. Then we've got another project um, that we've been working on. It's called Chassis. And uh, the idea here was that Many people have said in the past that Docker is hard, and you may or may not agree with that, but we, I think we can all agree that the building of a container is, or at least it should be, fairly standardized. It, 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 it shouldn't have to be, um, you, you shouldn't have to have millions of different types of containers running throughout your ML processes because they usually fall into very similar you know, clusters of, of types of containers. And so we sort of approach the problem from a slightly different angle where um, rather than sort of avoiding containers entirely, we just made it easier for data scientists to create those containers. And so, um, so this framework uses the ML flow packaging method. So again, that opinionated file structure, but then it securely bakes all of that model into a container with an external service. It actually runs an external service and, and, and behind it's using Kaneko and, and, and things like that. And it builds these containers inside the cluster and then pushes them back out to your Docker registry. At the moment, it currently supports um, the KF serving, the KServe API, uh, and also the Modsy API. Finally, there was a, a, an old project that was used for a quite a long time that was effectively like a cookie cutter for, for ML. People would provide um, template repositories that people could use to build their ML containers from. It's called Source to Image. Um, it's largely been overtaken now by build packs. And um, a quick note on the specialized serving containers. So when when we've been talking about serving our models, um, especially in the lands of like KServe and, and and other projects like that, they all take advantage of fairly standard standardized serving containers provided by various companies. You've got uh, Nvidia Triton, you've got uh, uh, PyTorch uh, TorchServe, you've got TensorFlow TS Serving, ML Server, OpenVINO from Intel, Selden ML Server. 
uh, and, and so on and so forth. And they all have slightly different feature sets and they're all sort of tailored towards specific use cases. So for example, Triton has some really interesting and useful GPU multiplexing technology in there that allows you to stuff multiple GPU models in the same container and run them and share the same GPU. Um, we've had all sorts of problems with various virtualized or GPU plugins on Kubernetes. And I, I think this is possibly an answer to those problems. Um, OpenVINO is interesting. That aims to be a framework that, that auto magically optimizes your heavy deep learning GPU requiring model into one that can run on a CPU, basically has loads of CPU optimizations on there um, to allow complex models to run on the CPU instead of the GPU. I think Torch Serve and, and, and TF Serving probably already know. ML Server is one that attempts to cover like a wide gamut of, of different frameworks and expose them all in a, a single a single way. So lots of sort of contrasting features there. I think we could probably talk a lot more about that um, on it on its own actually. And uh, yeah, do do let me know if you'd like me to to do a presentation on that specific subject. Uh, individually, because I, uh, I think that could all almost be a, a single presentation. All right, so that's sort of a quick roundup of the, the landscape. So what are some common themes that we can pull out from all of those frameworks? Well, the first thing is, is that, you know, we, I've been, we've been doing this for like nearly 10 years now, and um, we started using Kubernetes for serving uh, ML, our ML uh, models probably five years ago or something. And, and back then it really was just create your own container, write your own manifests, deploy it as a standard deployment in Kubernetes. Now though, there's a much greater uh, focus on specialization, like focusing on, on specific subparts of the problem. We've just seen the dedicated serving containers. We've also got dedicated orchestration frameworks now. It's not just Kubernetes, there's other layers on top that that, that make it more, um, that, that sort of abstract it for an ML specific purpose. We're also seeing abstractions in the, the definition of a model and the ML life cycle as well, just these YAMLs that are effectively trying to declare what the model is trying to do. And finally, we're seeing these, these helpers that try and you know, circumvent some of the difficulties in doing all of that by providing helpers effectively. We're also seeing a lot of opinions, and opinions are good because they're 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 the first step towards um, they're they're the first step towards an abstraction, and an abstractions are good because they they work in the domain that we work in, and you can hide the implementation details. But the problem is is that a lot of the cloud vendors, especially, are opinionated for a slightly different reason. They're opinionated principally to lock you into that specific technology. We we often have, we, we, we've actually had projects in the past to convert uh, models, training, training code from one cloud vendor to another cloud vendor. And it's, it's not, it's not easy, especially if you're trying to do it in the, in that, in, in the sort of the, the native way that the cloud vendor expects you to, to do this. Um, and so, you know, that, Ideally, I think hopefully what will happen is that we'll eventually end up with an abstraction and then people can implement the, the, the interface to that abstraction in a cloud specific way. So at that point, you'll be able to specify a model as that abstraction and then just say, deploy to AWS, deploy to GCP, deploy to Azure or, where, or, or Kubernetes or wherever you need to go. Once we're at that point, this problem will go away. Um, Thinking at a slightly more macro level, though, you know, these file structure requirements, uh, REST API requirements, Python API requirements, they're all basically the same thing. They're, they're an interface. But you have to be a little bit careful about which of those interfaces you actually go for. Because um, the lower you go, um, so for example, if you, if you go at the Python level, uh, if you have to inter in, if you have to implement a Python interface to to define your model, that's quite useful because you can effectively automate all of the things above it. You can automate the application of a REST API. You can automate the the container. You can automate the deployment, and all of those things can effectively be a big template, and that's 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 good. 
Um, but quite often you need more flexibility than that. So another approach is to make that interface higher. So, so don't use the Python interface at all. Use a REST interface or something even higher than that. And, um, and that gives you more flexibility because you can Im implement it in, in many different ways. But the issue is, is that you'll end up with 100 different ways of implementing something. So you have to be a little bit careful to choose like what, what point you're, you're willing to accept. Um, and those interfaces are, are great and they're consistent, but you will have exceptions. You will have cases where you, you need to change something or add something or, or, or something doesn't work in a specific way. Um, you need to sort of not, not plan for it, I guess, but you, you need to expect that that is going to happen at some point. So you don't want to be gung, you don't, um, you don't want to just, just focus on one way of doing things because things will change over time. Um, yeah, and those low level expectations, the must be in S3 and must use ECR, they're, they're just a locking tactic and, and, and they're, not, they're not helpful. Um, to bake or not to bake, that's been sort of, that's, that's been mentioned a few times throughout these projects. And actually, it's a, it's a really big argument because there's no right answer, I don't think. Both people are right. So personally, I, I sort of lean on, oh, actually, let me explain what this is first. So by bake, what I mean is you place the training artifacts which are usually something like model weights, plus some configuration maybe, plus some metadata maybe, um, and you place them all inside the final serving artifact, which is most often a container, but not, not necessarily, but yeah, most often it is. Um, that would be a definition of a baked container. If you don't bake, that means that your model weights, your model settings, uh, metadata, et cetera, lives external to the actual container that contains the code to run that model. Um, I lean slightly towards the bake. And the, and the main reason for that is that that artifact at that point in time is then immutable. It is a well-known versioned thing that is really useful for lineage and provenance and auditing. If you get regulated and the regul uh, an audit auditor comes in and says that this particular uh, individual was served with this particular prediction, like how, why, how did it happen? If you have a well-known artifact that actually created that prediction, it's very easy to go back. If you don't have that, if you have to look at, well, it was this version of the container, but the model weights were stored in S3, and we think it was called this name, but somebody might have changed those names because the naming convention has changed, or maybe someone deleted it accidentally, uh, and the metadata was stored in the metadata server and so on. It gets really complicated and, uh, and much harder to explain. But there's sort of some other pros and cons as well. So if you bake it, then there's a faster startup because um, a faster warm startup, I should say, because the all everything that the container needs is inside that container. So as, as soon as it's cached, it can start as fast as a container can be read into memory, which is usually in the order of a a few seconds. So if you've got really spiky loads and you're constantly going up and down for the number of instances of serving containers, that's a really, that's a, that's a, that's a big plus. Um, cons of, of, of baking though is that firstly, it's not that common. It's not that common. Only in the packages do we see baking actually being used. Um, for, for And even some of the packages don't. And I, I think, uh, yeah, sort of uh, bodywork, ML doesn't kind of expect you to bake things in. Um, uh, most of them expect the, the weights and everything else to be stored externally to the container. Um, and, and also, it's arguably harder to bake a container because that exposes it a little bit to the data scientist because they, they have to know about that container. They have to know that the weights have to go in there. Um, for no baking, we've mentioned some pros and cons, but one of the, the big pros is the, the idea of using golden images. And many, many enterprises try and sometimes fail <laughs> to mandate golden images for use. Um, the idea here is you pick one single container, you know it's secure, you know it's got the features you want. Um, we're also sort of talking about the, the, the serving containers that we talked about as well. Um, and, uh, you know, you're sort of decoupling them, the, the life cycle of the model from that container. There's one less 
CI step, you could argue that, you know, you'd have to build the container so you could save a bit of time inside your CI pipeline. Or it's arguable if that's a, an advantage because also, um, well, actually, I'll come to that in just a, in a second. And it's probably a little bit easier for data scientists because the data scientists almost don't need to care about this thing called the container. You know, all they care about is the model weights that's stored here and this tar.gz. I just update this manifest and, and press go. Um, makes it much harder for provenance. We talked about that. Much slower startup time because each time it's got to down re-download those weights. Some of these models are, you know, hundreds of megabytes, potentially gigabytes. Um, you've got to re-download that every time. So that's going to slow down your startup time unless you cache it, obviously. Um, and also, actually, this is a this is a bigger problem in my eyes. Um, when, a, when we do this, we often see build-related issues at runtime. We get complaints from data scientists saying, I've just deployed this new thing, and it's given me this horrible Python stack trace. And it turns out that the way that they've trained their model is like with a, a new version of PyTorch or, or whatever, and it's not compatible with the current version of the golden image because that had a different major version of PyTorch, for example. So the, the file structures are, are different and they're getting these horrible stack traces. So you shouldn't be debugging this at runtime. It, you know, that's that's a build issue. It should be caught at build time when, when the CI is, is, is running the build. So what ends up is that you actually have to add another step back to your CI process to test that the, the that, the, that your model actually works with the current version of the golden image. So I, I've said one less CI step here, but I've, I've basically added it back in because you need extra testing. <laughs> so um, yeah, swings and roundabouts. Um, there's a um, there's a there's a yeah there's an issue with sharing things. So so the idea here is that most organizing organizations you, you should aim to standardize. Standardization is a good thing. Because as soon as you standardize, you can raise the level of abstraction and you can automate away everything, um, yeah, ev everything else. Um, but the problem is, is like, how do you do that? H how do you share these artifacts? How do you share things? How do you share code, containers, interfaces? Um, I mean, the, the, there's no sort of easy answer to this problem because different layers of the stack have different needs. Um, for code, for example, the, usually the best way of sharing code is via libraries because the library uh, implementation in the language of choice is, is usually has some, you know, ch checks and balances that it can it can do on that. For for containers, I see golden containers being thrown around a lot, and actually they're really hard to manage because you end up with, you know, a PyTorch. 9.1, PyTorch, CUDA 10.2, uh, GPU version, a CPU, you end up with a million containers, a million golden images as you sort of work through all of those exceptions. Um, we're, we're working on one project at the moment, which is attempting to build, uh, to use build packs, basically a, a build pack for ML. And I, and I think that build packs have the potential to solve that problem because you can insert build packs, uh, you can insert builders, uh, to and share builders at different parts of the build process. So you can imagine like a, an enterprise level, like security builder, uh, an enterprise level uh, ML builder, and think, think, things like that to eventually build your container at the end. So that's potentially a good way of sharing. Um, interfaces, how do you share interfaces? Again, that's a much higher, higher level problem. It's like through metadata repositories, catalogs, things like that. Um, so sharing work, sharing your ML work is, I think, a little bit of an unsolved problem, but hopefully that gives you a few ideas. So key takeaways from this presentation. I think the first thing that I was really impressed by, actually, was the, the level of maturity in, in the dedicated serving containers. Before I looked, I didn't really, I didn't appreciate how much variety existed and how um, sophisticated they were. So take advantage of those serving containers. Um, use an orchestration abstraction. We've been doing this for quite a long time. We were very early users in KServe, so this wasn't new to me, but it might be new to you. Those orchestration abstractions are really cool, really useful, and uh, really scalable. Prioritize lineage, audibility, reproducibility. Uh, 
a bit of a longer discussion um, sort of related to standardization here. You know, if, if, if you're automating your processes in such a way to make them one click and they're all tracked and recorded, then that's great. Um, invest in making repeated difficulties easy and automated. That's how Chassis was born. Um, you know, we were re repeatedly building containers all the time. We needed them to be built in, this, in, a, in, a, in a secure way in cluster. Uh, so that's an example of that. Aim for abstractions to help avoid lock-in. Hopefully, there will be uh, abstractions that emerge naturally, open source ab abstractions that emerge over time, and that will help avoid the current status of lock-in to the cloud vendors. Um, and yeah, look to standardize where possible, because as soon as you start to standardize within your business, within your organization, uh, at any level, then it aids automation of everything else. Um, a general thing, a few things to, to watch out for. Beware of the tooling burden. There's a lot of tools that I'm talking about here. Um, you need to make sure that you're mapping your choice of tools to the capabilities and the capacity of your operational teams. If you don't have an MLOps team, then you might want to look at the managed services or some of the uh, uh, the, the MLOps vendors, um, because, you know, you, you, the, these, these tools are quite sophisticated, they're very flexible, um, but because they're flexible, they're quite fragile, and, and you, do need, you do need dedicated people to be able to look after these things. Um, if you're using a cloud vendor, oh, I didn't mention this, actually. Um, all of the cloud vendors, when you're deploying your artifact into, uh, uh, starting to serve your artifact, all of the cloud vendors allow you to parameterize the resources that are used for that model, but they do that by providing you with a VM. You have to specify the size of the VM in order to run your model. So if you're if you're a typical comp, you know large enterprise and you've got you know five different versions of your model running and you've got hundreds of different models running at the same time and you've got two different parts of the organization that's all doing the same thing. That's hundreds of, of, of hundreds, if not thousands of machines that are serving your ML models that are probably not doing anything. It gets really expensive really quickly. And at that point, you, you, you know, you're quite locked in, so it's hard to get away from it. Um, so just watch out for that. Uh, but yeah, on, on the other hand, the, the one thing, I've, I've, I think I've been bashing the cloud vendors a little bit. The one thing that the cloud vendors do really well is that uh, they make it very easy to make your model very reliable and very stable. Um, because, you know, when you're doing all of this yourself, there, there can be a, a lot of drama, you know, Kubernetes clusters, nodes going down and, and God knows what else. But the, the, the toil does get quite stressful. So uh, watch out for that. Last slide, I promise. Sorry, I'm way over time. Uh, plan of action for you. What, what do I recommend that you do now? Investigate those serving containers. I, I pretty much guarantee that you are probably not using the right serving container for the models that you are running in production today. Do a bit of an investigation there. Consider if it's uh, beneficial to move to a different use case, uh, a, a different container, I mean. Um, concentrate on lineage. Mentioned this a few times. I think I, I think baking is really important. I think lineage is really important. Um, and double down on 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 abstractions because that's ultimately where uh, efficiency will come from. And they may even be organization specific. I've heard of a, a few examples of, of some of these projects that have actually emerged from organization specific abstractions. So uh, yeah, it's good good. Uh, it's a good time to, to start investigating what you're doing and maybe thinking about open sourcing that. Okay, I will end my presentation there. My name's Dr. Phil Winder and I'm the CEO of Winder.ai. If you have any more questions or if you would like us to come and help you in your business, then please visit Winder.ai. You can email me at phil at Winder.ai or you can tweet slash LinkedIn me at Dr. Phil Winder. Um, check out winter.ai slash events for, for more of these talks. We've got a few more coming up. And um, I'll now move on to questions. Thank you very much.
Okay, so it looks like we don't have too many questions available. No, I don't think we've got any at the moment. Hopefully that's not a technical issue. Hopefully that's just because no one's asked anything. <laughs> I've had that before. Um, but uh, either way, if you've got any more questions, I'll uh, endeavor to answer them or you can reach out via email. And with that, I'll leave you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.